Hi, uh, I'm clearly not at your local senior center because it's COVID-19 time. And so uh, my seminars at local senior centers have really been put on hold because the, the, the things happening at the senior center have really been put on hold. But I decided um, in many cases in conjunction with the senior center uh, directors to talk about the issues that I was going to be talking about there or in the case of in, in, a, in a number of areas. And the topic for today, I think, is a topic that comes up all the time, which is people calling me saying, so when should I review my estate plan? Now, of course, that really varies from person to person. You should always be reviewing your estate plan if something dramatic has happened in your life, if somebody has died, if somebody has, has become disabled. But I wanted to talk uh, with you in general about how you want to be looking at when you should be reviewing your estate plan. So you say, remember, we're talking always about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and what I decided that I would do is talk to you about how their estate planning issues may change over time. So you've often seen my picture of, a, of Frank and Mary when they're probably 70 or 80 years old. Uh, but I wanted to start off by talking about Frank and Mary before then back when they were 40. Uh, and by the way, one of the reasons why this is really relevant to folks is life expectancy right now uh, is, is about 80 years old. Um, so it's kind of reasonable that you could be thinking about planning until you were 80. So Frank and Mary, back when they were 40, they had their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., but they were just little kids at that time. Uh, and so Frank and Mary's real issue at that time was, really, how do we take care of these kids? Um, they had some assets, but they really weren't that big. You know, they had a house, but it was subject to a big mortgage, so they had uh, some value. Frank and Mary each had a, a, uh, an IRA, and they had some savings. Their biggest asset actually was their life insurance policy, which was really only going to be of significance to them. They were protecting themselves in case one of the kids died. So their total assets were $675,000 if both of them died. So there were no estate tax issues. Their big issue was making sure that if the two of them died, the kids were gonna be safe. So they really needed a will at that time to deal with that because there is no way to provide or name a guardian and take care of those issues related to your kids who are under age 18, um, except by putting that kind of information in a will. So they would have wanted a will. Um, they'd probably have a, um, a uh, specify on their life insurance policy that they would name each other, but that they would also name as the alternate on their life insurance policy, there is the estate, their estate, so that if they died suddenly, all the assets would flow through this will uh, for the benefit of their kids. Um, they probably own all of their assets jointly with rights of survivorship, so that if one of them died, there wouldn't be the necessity for, for probate. Um, but finally, they would want to make sure that they had a power of attorney and a health care proxy. Very basic documents, which by the way, Frank and Mary at all ages need, but they really need it then in order to make sure that if one of them is incapacitated, as opposed to if one of them dies, if one of them is incapacitated, that their spouse typically can take care of things for them, can take care of their financial issues through their power of attorney and can make medical decisions for them through the health care proxy um, if a doctor says that the an individual doesn't have the ability to make the decisions themselves. So a power of attorney, it's very simple. They need to do a power of attorney. It needs to be notarized uh, in order to make sure that folks will accept it. Even though there's no legal requirement for notarizations, you want it notarized because many people won't accept them otherwise. You want to make the power of attorney specific. You want to make sure that the person you're naming on the power of attorney can handle your real estate matters, can get to banks, can take care of your IRAs, your 401ks. You want to make sure that that person with your power of attorney can make gifts on your behalf. Um, and you want to review that power of attorney every five years just in, in, and get it updated every five years just because, and I've had this situation happen many times, many banks, uh, other, other kinds of financial institutions will not accept an older power of attorney even though it is still legally valid as far as Massachusetts is concerned. Similarly, uh, if Frank and Mary are dealing with the healthcare proxy issues, they want to make sure they have a proxy, they want to make sure they know where it is, they want to make sure that it is fi on file with their doctor so that if there is a medical emergency and they have to go to the hospital, there's no issue about scuffling around trying to find out where the healthcare proxy is. 
If, the, if they give the health care proxy to their doctor, their doctor is actually legally required to keep it in their medical record. The health care proxies, uh, you're going to need two witnesses. Um, your, the health care proxy does not automatically give the person that you've named in your health care proxy so-called HIPAA powers or HIPAA authority, that is the authority to examine the, um, the, the medical records of the person who is sick. So you may want to make sure that that is specifically in there even if you're not incapacitated. Um, finally, if you're traveling, if you go to Florida in the winter, if you go wherever you go, you want to make sure you have a healthcare proxy that's valid in that state. Healthcare proxies are not portable. They vary from state to state. You want to make sure if you're going to two places regularly that you have two healthcare proxies. And if you, if you do a new health, healthcare proxy, it automatically revokes any old one. So if you're, if you're Frank and Mary and your kids are little, that's what you really wanted to focus on. If you're getting a little older and you're Frank and Mary and you're not 40 anymore, you're 60, then you're going to be dealing with other kinds of issues. You're not as concerned about guardianship issues. And therefore, to the extent that you can, you, you may want to structure things so as to avoid the probate process by having things pass through trust as opposed to through a will. But you may want to deal about with some specific issues regarding the kids. Uh, it, my, my typical Frank and Mary will say that when they die, they simply want their assets to be divided equally among the kids. The question, though, is, are the kids in a position where you want them to have the assets if something happens to you? Is there a potential divorce that you may be worried about? Is there one of your kids that isn't doing well? Is, are there potential creditor issues? Do you have a child um, that, who, who may have financial problems, whether it's with an individual creditor, with the IRS, so where, where you, you are concerned that if you give that child some assets, those assets will really end up going to these other creditors? And finally, is there an incapacity issue? Have, do you have a child who has perhaps some drug problems, who has some other mental problems, who has a cognitive issue? In any of those cases, what you probably want to do is structure things so that upon your death or the death of the two of you, those assets would go in trust for the benefit of that person. You could probably name one of your other children or someone else that you trusted as the trustee. And that really leads to the kind of broader question of whether you want to structure things in general um, so that these assets, if you die owning them, will not have to go through the probate process. Once again, that's less of a concern for Frank and Mary when they're 40. If they're getting a little bit older though and they're now 60, they may be concerned about that. The way to avoid the probate process, if you're that age, while keeping total control of your assets, is to create a revocable and amendable trust. You would name the two of you as the trustees, Frank and Mary in this case as the trustees. They would specify in their revocable and amendable trust that, as the name implies, it could be revoked at any time so that they could change the rules or that they could take the property that was in trust out of trust at any time. It's amendable so they can also amend the rules at any time so that if their kid's situation changes um, so, and they want to change their plan to make sure that in the event of their deaths the kids are treated the way they want them to be treated, they can change those rules. They would name each other as the trustees so that either one of them, if one of them died, could act as the sole trustee. They would specify though in that situation that when the second of the two of them had died, someone else would step in as the new trustee. Who should that someone be? Well, at this point, um, Frank and Mary are getting older and so are their kids. It may be that they're, one, just they're comfortable having one of their children handle the matters as trustee. It may be they want all their kids and they can do that. Uh, what you always want to make sure if you're naming multiple trustees is that there are no ties, though. You don't want to be in a situation where your kids are disagreeing on something and their only way of resolving the dispute is going to court. So if there are three of them acting as trustee, you probably want to say that things are done by majority vote. If there are two of them as trustee, you probably want to say that if they can't make a decision on something, there's going to be a tiebreaker. Oftentimes, I or my colleagues uh, at Myrick O'Connell who do this kind of work will actually act as the tiebreaker in these documents, or at least uh, the possibility of our acting will be in the documents. It's been my experience that as soon as the folks who are trying to figure out what to do realize 
that a tiebreaker is going to come in and charge them to break the tie, the tie gets the issue gets resolved. So you you may that may be a handy way to deal with that. Once again, the handy thing about structuring things through the revocable and amendable trust is that first of all, you can lay all of this out so that upon your death, the kids are going to know, some kids may be getting their assets directly, other kids may be getting them, put, having their assets put in trust, but it's going to be clear and can be done right away because all of the assets that are in trust are going to avoid the probate process. Why would you want to avoid probate? The problem with probate uh, is that assets that flow in, through the probate process cannot be distributed to the ultimate beneficiaries for at least a year. The reason for that is that creditors of the person who died have one year to file um, uh, claims against the probate estate. So if you're concerned about avoiding probate uh, and you want to keep control of your assets while you're alive, while making sure that things are clear in terms of what happens after you die, this may be the way that you want to go. The other issue for Frank and Mary if they're, se if they're 60 is that maybe their assets have started piling up, which often happens. Uh, people who had a house that was worth a little suddenly have a house that's worth a lot more. In the meantime, slowly the mortgage gets paid down. So Frank and Mary, who when they were, when they were 40, had assets that, that didn't equal over a million dollars, suddenly they do. Suddenly they have a house on which they have a, a small mortgage, but quite a bit of equity. Now Frank's 401k and Mary's IRA have gotten bigger. They've now got some savings. The life insurance policy is still there. Um, so now they've got assets that have a total value of $1,400,000. If they were to die suddenly, their children would pay an estate tax of about $68,240 on that. So when Frank and Mary are 60, or really at any point where they have assets that they've accumulated that have a value of more than a million dollars, they may be wanting to structure things so that they can avoid the Massachusetts estate tax. And they can do that while at the same time structuring things so as to avoid probate. The Massachusetts estate tax, how does it work basically? Well, uh, if you die having assets that, that are, are going to someone as a result of your death, then those assets are included in your taxable estate. That includes, by the way, life insurance proceeds. Most people do not realize that life insurance proceeds are part of the taxable estate. And it includes any assets that are going to someone as a result of your death, whether or not they go through probate. There is a difference between the probate estate and the taxable estate. Once you figure out your taxable estate, the tax gets computed in two different ways. First, you would look at this chart. This is a chart that was created at the time that the estate tax in Massachusetts was created, back in the 1920s. At that time, $40,000 was a lot of money. And so the, the estate tax started taxing uh, folks starting if they had an estate, a taxable estate of over $40,000. It's a gradual tax. That first estate tax is only eight tenths of 1% on the dollars between 40,000 and 90,000. It's 1.6% on the dollars between 90,000 and 140,000, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the effect of this chart, to give you a sense of this, if, the, if the, there was a taxable estate of, 36, of uh, $1 million, is that the tax would be $36,560. Uh, on, in their situation, where they have an estate of $1,100,000, the tax would be $42,640. So, um, but, but you, I, you've probably heard that there is no tax if you have an estate of less than a million dollars. The reason for that is that many years ago, uh, starting I believe in the 50s, in order to try to deal with the fact that people's assets had gone up, especially because of the increase in real estate values, Massachusetts created an alternate tax system and said regarding that system, if you have assets of less than a particular amount, and that amount is now a million dollars, there is no estate tax. In order to catch up with the chart though, Massachusetts says that if your tax, if you have an estate of greater than a million dollars, you, you calculate your tax in two different ways. First, you figure out what your tax would have been according to the chart. Then you figure out what it would have been using this alternative tax. 
Whatever the lower of the two tax rates is, that's the amount that you pay. So for example, if you had a estate of a million dollars under the chart, you would have owed $36,560. Using the alternative tax table, you'd owe zero. Look, go all the way down though to a million two hundred thousand dollars. At that point, using the chart, your tax would have been forty-nine thousand dollars, but using the alternative tax, it would have been eighty thousand. In either case, you calculate both taxes and you get charged the lesser of the two. I tried to illustrate this by just showing you a little diagram. So once again, um, the red line indicates what the what your tax would actually be. Uh, if you had a million dollars, then the re then then your tax was going would be zero. If you had a million twenty thousand dollars, your tax would be, uh, excuse me. If you had a million two hundred or or, or uh, twenty thousand dollars, your tax would be eight thousand dollars, et cetera, et cetera. So you always get taxed the lower of the these two things. The way to avoid this tax, therefore, because the tax only applies to taxable estates of less than a of more than a million dollars is to make sure that neither person's taxable estate ever goes over that amount. The way you do that is by having each of you have a trust and have that trust specify that at the time of your death up to a million dollars that would have gone to the surviving spouse instead goes in trust for the benefit of that surviving spouse. To the extent that you do that, those assets when the surviving spouse dies will not be counted as part of her taxable estate. The surviving spouse can actually be the trustee of that trust. The surviving spouse can have total control of those assets so that you, by doing this, you're not penalizing your, your spouse, your surviving spouse. You're not putting those assets out of her control. What you are doing though is making sure that once, when the two of you have died, there will be no estate tax on the, on, that your kids are going to have to pay. So for example, in this case, you may recall that Frank and Mary's total assets were worth $1,400,000. If um, Frank had structured things, if Frank was, 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 got sick and structured things to make sure that, say, the, re the equity in the house, which was $250,000, and some of his savings, which was worth $200,000, went into trust for the benefit of his spouse, then those assets, that $450,000, um, would, would, when she died, not be includable in her taxable estate. When he dies, they won't be includable in his taxable estate because the assets that he's giving her that are being held in trust are worth less than a million dollars. So the result of that is when Mary dies, her estate will, her, her taxable estate will only be $950,000, therefore being under a million, so there will be no estate tax. So for folks who are like Frank and Mary, 60 years old, and concerned about this because their assets have accumulated, that's often an ideal plan to allow them to A, avoid the probate process, and B, avoid the estate tax. But what about Frank and Mary when they're 70? Uh, at that point, once again, their estate planning goals may be changing. One of the reasons they may be changing um, one may be that their assets have simply accumulated, they've accumulated more. In this example, um, we're assuming that at that point, Frank and Mary have no mortgage. Their house is, is worth $400,000. Frank's, Fr Frank's 401k got bigger. Mary's IRA got bigger. There are more in savings. You still have the life insurance. So they've got more assets, $1,900,000. But also at that point, uh, Frank and Mary are getting concerned not just about the possible estate tax, which in this case would be uh, almost $100,000 when the two of them died, unless they do, do that estate tax planning. Um, they're worried about, if one, they're more concerned about one of them possibly getting sick, about there needing to be someone who, are going, who is going to take care of things for them. They're also concerned at this age that if one of them gets sick, the other person the other person may also have some physical or, or, or some physical problems. So at that point, Frank and Mary, even if they haven't updated their powers of attorney or healthcare proxies up to that point in order to name an alternate person uh, to act if, if their spouse can't do it, they probably want to do that. And they probably want to name one of their kids. They could actually name 
um, regarding their health care proxy, they can only name one person at a time. So each spouse would need to name their spouse as their, as their, as their initial uh, proxy agent, but they could name one of the children uh, as the alternate. Regarding their power of attorney, they actually have the ability to name multiple people at the same time. So Frank could name Mary as his agent on the power of attorney and then name one or more of the kids as the alternates. He could name two kids as the alternates or three, or he could name everybody uh, jointly and severally. He could name his wife and all three kids jointly and severally on that power of attorney. The e legal effect of that is that any one of those people, if the others aren't around, can take care of things, can handle Frank's financial, uh, financial affairs for him. The other issue that Frank and Mary get nervous about, though, and that usually happens at about age 70, um, is that they're concerned about what might happen to their substantial assets in the event that one of them needs to qualify for mass health, either because he or she needs nursing home care or needs a lot of care at, ho at home in order to avoid going to a nursing home. Their goal is very simple. They want to live at home until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. But the question is, if Mary got sick and Mary was concerned about either being able to stay at home, which can cost a lot if she needs a lot of home care, or about going to a nursing home, then the question is how can she be assured that her assets will be protected so that she'll still be able to leave her children something after she dies? Well, the answer to that, while Frank and Mary are both alive, is very straightforward and easy. Uh, once again, we're assuming that those are their assets and that their total assets are worth $1,900,000. In that situation, uh, if Mary needed, to, to, needed nursing home care uh, or needed a lot of care at home and wanted to qualify for Mass Health, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, so that Mass Health could cover most or all of those bills, she would not need to have done an irrevocable trust ahead of time. She would not need to have transferred all of her assets out into somebody else's name ahead of time. The reason for that is um, that while, as may, many of you may have heard, if you try to transfer assets to a third party uh, in order to protect them and not have them be countable if you need to qualify for mass health, there's typically a five-year look-back period regarding that transfer. There is no look-back period regarding transfers between spouses. So in this situation, if, Frank, if Mary needed nursing home care, Mary could at the last minute, literally the day before she, be, she applied for Mass Health, she could transfer the home to Frank, even if the two of them owned it, or even if, if just she owned it. She could have other cash or cash equivalent assets, uh, um, or, or she could transfer all of the cash to Frank. Uh, and by, because Mary, well, in order to qualify for Mass Health, Mary has to have less than uh, $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank, uh, as the healthy spouse, can own the home, can have up to $128,640 in other cash or cash equivalent assets. So Mary can start off by transferring the home to Frank. She can transfer all the assets to Frank. The only problem at that point, given Frank's assets, is that he would have more than $128,640 in countable assets. The point, though, is that Frank can also have unlimited income. Unlimited income. So what Frank and Mary would do in this situation is Mary would first shift all of her assets to Frank. Frank would keep the house. Frank would keep, say, $100,000 in other cash or cash equivalent assets and use the rest to purchase an annuity. As long as that annuity was for a term that was shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount would be a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So if today Mary shifted all of his at her assets to Frank, and if tomorrow Frank kept the other assets but you, and kept up to $100,000 in the other assets plus the house and then bought an annuity, the day after tomorrow Mary could qualify for mass health. So, there is every, so while the two of them are alive, there isn't a crucial need um, for, for them to be planning to, to, for mass health by transferring all the assets out of their name, losing control of their assets, none of that. What they do want to make sure, though, 
is that if one of them dies, the other one is going to be safe. Because remember, in the, in the earlier estate plans that we talked about, Mary and Frank's basic goal was if one of them died, all the assets would go to the other. Well, if that happened, if Frank died tomorrow and Mary then needed that nursing home care, that would be a problem for Mary because now she would have way too much in assets. Remember, they have almost $2 million in assets. They can solve that problem, though, and they can solve that problem ahead of time without losing control of their assets. The way they do that is by structuring things so that when the first one dies, all the assets owned by that spouse go into trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. In this situation, for instance, if Frank had a will that said, when I die, I want all of the assets that would have gone to my wife Mary to instead go in trust for the benefit of my wife Mary, and I'm gonna name one or more of my kids as the trustees, I can name anybody else that I want as the trustee. If I die, those assets will immediately be safe, non-countable, and non-leanable in the event that Mary needs to qualify for mass health. Now many people um, will, come, will, will first talk to me because one of them is nervous about this, one of them has perhaps had some, dement some memory problems, is concerned that in the long run they may need nursing home care. And I'll talk to them about structuring things that way at that point. Having wills in place so that if one of them dies, the other one is going to be safe. In that kind of situation, if Mary were already experiencing some memory loss problems and Frank and Mary talked, came in to talk to me, I'd say in addition to having these wills in place, you may, have to, may want to actually transfer the assets to Frank so that if Frank dies suddenly, if Frank has a heart attack, if something really bad happens, before you can take care of things, you can know that Frank's assets are going to be safe. The main thing to understand though is that that doesn't have to be done or you don't have to wait until somebody's already sick to figure all that stuff out. You can do this plan ahead of time so that if either Frank or Mary ends up getting sick, um, the assets can quickly be transferred to the person who is, who is about to die so that upon that person's death, the other person will be safe. Or if one of them needs nursing home care, the assets can be transferred away from the person who has nursing, needs the care so that if the survivor needs something, the survivor is going to be safe. So to summarize, the issue, your estate planning issues are gonna change depending on, often on how old you are, on your asset situation, on what your worries are. The goal should be, my recommendation would be, every five years, every five years, call your lawyer and just ask him or her. Talk to him, just ask. That's the safest thing that you can do uh, as in the long run to make sure that your estate plan is right for you. Thank you very much.